Don't worry, friends, there are maps coming, maps and pictures, so we will get there today. But before we get to maps and pictures, let's start with a blessing. I want to bless you. I want good things for your life. I want God's breakthroughs in your situations. And so I bless you now in the name of Jesus that you would know Jesus more wonderfully tonight. I bless you to receive healing if you need healing in your body, in your mind, in your emotions, in your spirit tonight. I bless you to receive whatever guidance from God you need tonight. Whatever help from God you need immediately. I bless you to have the courage and capacity to flourish and prevail over whatever challenges you're facing in your life right now. And I bless you to feel hope and joy and love and peace, whatever's going on. I bless you in the name of Jesus. May it be. Amen. All right. Today, friends, we are beginning a new study looking at the life of Abraham, who according to Romans chapter 4, is the father of faith. The father of faith for all who believe. Sometimes we hear this word faith and we think of it as some sort of ethereal concept out there. Or maybe we just have a niche view of faith where we think, okay, faith is just about believing in Jesus for our salvation. It includes that, but there is more to faith. When we go through this series and we're looking at Abraham, the father of faith for all who believe, we're talking about faith in its most common biblical definition. This idea of faith that results in obeying. Faith that leads to obeying. Abraham is one of the great examples in the Bible when it comes to somebody who has faith, meaning trusts God, resulting in obeying God. Hebrews chapter 11 writes about Abraham, and it says this in verse 8. It says, it was by faith that Abraham obeyed. There we go. Those are the connections right there. Faith, obedience. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as, it is, as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. And even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith. For he was, no long, he was, he was like a foreigner living in tents. And so did Isaac and Jacob who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations. A city designed and built by God. Okay, by faith, Abraham obeyed, and then when it, when it was appropriate, stayed. He didn't go back. He kept going. He kept going in, in faith. And that, this is the kind of themes that we're going to be pushing on each other over this next few weeks. This idea of it doesn't matter if we know exactly how things are going to turn out or when things are going to unfold. We look to Jesus, we trust Jesus, and by trusting him, it changes our decisions. It changes how we live, and it changes what we do. And we don't just start that way when we're young, like me, but over the course of our lives, we just keep going. We just keep going. All right. Also, I want to say right off the bat that Abraham is imperfect. I love that about this story. Abraham is the father of faith, but we're going to see several major faith fail moments where he doesn't trust God. And there's some consequences there, some major consequences in his life. But by the end, he learns. And he keeps learning as he goes through life. The older and older he gets, he keeps learning that it is safe and good to trust and obey this God. Not only is Abraham the father of faith for all who believe, he's also called three times in the Bible... God's friend. God's friend. James writes about the ones, the quotes in the Old Testament, and in James chapter 2, it says this about Abraham. It says, Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He was even called the friend of God. That's in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 8, 2 Chronicles 20, verse 7, where it refers to Abraham as God's friend. But, but don't you love that? that? That idea of Abraham not just being the father of faith, but also the friend of God. I, I've, I've often wanted, and throughout my life, I want to be not just God's child, which is amazing, but I want to be God's friend. How? you become 
God's friend, not just follower, but friend, not just servant, not just obe- friend. Jesus tells us. He makes it clear. John 15. He says, you are my friends if you do what I command. Obedience. Obedience right there. Friendship. Obedience. You are my friends if you do what I command. He's speaking to his disciples there. And he says, I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me. You can become God's friend if you keep doing, not just once, but you, you have a life of keep doing what God tells you to do. And again, I don't, I don't want to just be God's son, a son, a child of God. I want to be his friend. And, and so this is something that we're going to be calling each other to, exhorting each other to. For this next season, we're going to be talking about, yes, it is challenging to obey God when we don't know what's going to unfold. It, when, we're, when we're blind about what's going to happen. We, when we maybe don't even like what the results are looking like they're going to be. It's, it's hard to trust God in that moment. But not only is it challenging to live by faith and keep trusting God and keep obeying God, it does come with perks. Friendship with God. And God talks more to his friends. God says more to his friends. Right there with Jesus, he's like, you are my friends, I'm tell- I've told you everything. Again, there's examples of that in Abraham's life as well. Everyone who has faith in Jesus, everyone who believes in Jesus, who gives your life to Jesus, will be saved. That's a great starting point. We're going to be talking about now living this life of faith. How to live it by continuing to walk in that, walk in obedience Every Christian would say, yes, I trust God. And during this series, I'm going to keep saying, look, friends, trusting is trusting. Trusting is actually trusting. It's not just something, yeah, I trust God. No, trusting means trusting, and and trusting keeps trusting. Anyways, we're, we're ahead of ourselves. I don't want to talk about all that today. Today... Today, I want to just make sure we're on the same page when it comes to to the background story of Abraham. I want to remind you of different passages in the Bible that kind of sets the stage for Abraham's background. I want to have some maps. I want to have some pictures and just kind of get ready for the story that we're going to really dive into next week. Abraham's starting point is he wasn't raised in a godly family. He wasn't raised in a Christian family, obviously, but he wasn't raised in a Yahweh, God of the Bible, my God, our God's family. He wasn't raised in somebody like that. This isn't what it says in Joshua chapter 24. Joshua said to the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham, Abraham's dad, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River, and they worshipped other gods. But I took your ancestor Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and and led him into the land of of Canaan. So the Bible's very clear. Terah, Abraham's dad, didn't worship Yahweh, the God of the Bible. In fact, it never says that he does at any point in in this, this story. And you might be like, well... If, if Abraham wasn't raised in a Yahweh worship family before Abraham meets God, did he worship other gods? It, the Bible doesn't say. We would be making up that answer. It doesn't say that. So uh, I'm going to just leave that to the side. I, what we do know, though, is Abraham's dad, Terah, didn't worship Yahweh. He worshiped other, other gods. I, I kind of like that starting point. If your family background is anything but godly. Maybe even worshiping other, other gods or whatever. If your family background has nothing to do with Jesus, you can have incredible faith going forward. 
as you keep learning about this God and you keep learning that our God can be trusted, you can become a friend of God just like Abraham who had that same sort of starting point. An idol-worshiping father. Ah, love that. So anyways, Abraham's family were not believers, but at some point, the Bible is clear that God revealed himself to Abraham. And I love this. Acts chapter 7. This is Stephen telling the story. And Stephen says, Our glorious God appeared to our ancestor Abraham. I don't know if you ever use any of these Bible titles when, when you're praying. Glorious, my glorious God. Right? Uh, our glorious God appeared to our ancestor Abraham in, in Mesopotamia before he settled in Haran. God told him, leave your native land and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. So Abraham left the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran until his father died. Then God brought him here to the land where you now live. I guess in summary, Abraham born in Mesopotamia, which we know actually the city, because Genesis 11 tells us, and we'll look at that in a second. The city is Ur, the city of Ur, which is, according to history, the last capital city of the Sumerian Empire. The, the last capital city there. So he's raised in this capital city, Ur, into a family who didn't worship Yahweh, the creator of heaven and earth. I think it's time for a map. Is that going to be all right? Yes. Thank you. Map, map time. All right, map time. Uh, so, oh, oh, oh. oh, there's so much goodness on this map, friends. All right. Ooh, uh. Okay, so uh, I don't know if you know this, but Abraham's story is really early in the Bible. There's only really four events that take place before we get to the Abraham story. Lots of time, but you have the creation, chapters 1 and 2. You've got the fall of humanity and death entering, Adam, Eve, Cain, and Abel, kind of 3 and 4. You've got some genealogies and stuff like that going on as well, but... The, the third story then, the third basic chunk of story is Noah. Noah. And then you get to chapter 11. That, that's all that really happens. Uh, in, in, now, I put at the top of this map Noah's boat to scale. No, not to scale. A little purple, little purple boat up at the top up there at Mount Ararat. Because what we, at the beginning of the Bible, this is actually in chapter 9, they get out of the boat. Noah's family disembarks. And God gives them some direction, some command. This is what I want you to do. Trust me and obey me. I want you to go. I want you to spread out. I want you to fill the earth. I want you to scatter. I want you to, to spread out over all the earth. That's the commission. That's the command from Mount Ararat, from where, where that boat is. Okay? Scatter, repopulate. And that's in chapter 9. Then we get to chapter 11, the next story. And what happens? Well, we see that God's people, or all the people, started doing that. And they started spreading out. But eventually, a group of them decides, you know, we have been doing what God's wanted. We have been spreading out. But we don't want to do that anymore. And this is what we read in chapter 11, starting in verse 2. As the people migrated to the east, again, obeying, scattering, doing what God says... They found a plain in the land of Babylonia and settled there. They settled there. Verse 4. Then they said, come, let us build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. We have been scattering, but we don't want to do that anymore. We have been following the direction, but we want to now stop being scattered. And we want to settle here. We don't want to obey God, and we have been, but now we want to settle here. We have friends. Here's the thing. God is going to call you to walk by faith, not just generally, but very specifically throughout the course of your life. He's not going to just tell you when you're young to trust him and take risks. All your life, God is going to be challenging you to keep walking by, by faith. And, and the time will come probably many times in your life where you will want to 
stop. Where you won't want to take that next step. Where, where you're going to look at your life and your situation and you're like, you know what? I like it here. I mean, I have trusted God. I have followed him. I have done all these things. And it has brought me to this point in life. And maybe I'm very thankful for all the God things in my life. But now, this is it. This is where I want to be. And I don't want to push myself to take the next faith step. I don't want to push myself to make the next change in my life. I don't want to push myself to, to, to risk, risk losing what I've got, risk using, losing what I like right here. Instead, I want to just settle here. I want to settle here. The time's going to come where you're going to want to stop. Many times, potentially, where stop obeying the next direction God gives you and settle. It is one of the prime things in my heart to never settle. I'm terrified of settling because the temptation grows. The older you get, the more you have to risk, the more you have to lose. I don't want to be somebody who, who settles. I want to just keep going. But I know me. I know what goes on in my head. I know the temptation uh, to just try and coast on last year's testimonies or the, or the good faith moments in the past or the changes I made in the past and, and not want to make the hard step today. Why don't I want to make the hard step today? Because it's hard. Because it's challenging. And every year that goes by, the temptation to settle grows. And it, and it keeps bombarding you. And, and, yeah, that was good. free. That's fun. Back to the map, though, for a second. So the purple circle kind of on the lower right is where the Tower of Babel story is in chapter 11. Start, start of chapter 11. That's, what, that's how you can remember. Chapter 11, Babel, right? It's, it's, the, it's the story after the flood. It's the next story after the flood. It's where they want to settle and, and not move on any further. Also in chapter 11, we're introduced to Terah and, and his family. Now on this map here, that, they're, they're starting off in Ur down in the bottom right. The, the red circle is number, number one. It's about 50 miles downriver from Babel. Very close by, same area, sort of a thing. In Abraham's day and in Terah's day, Ur was on the shore of the Persian Gulf. The Persian Gulf is the, the blue bit that's sticking out of the corner there. Um, the sea levels were much higher back then. Sea levels much, much higher, all the way up to Ur, where that is. And, then, and so Ur is this amazing, rich capital city where the Euphrates River, this incredible river that goes through all these empires up to the north, where it joins the Persian Gulf. So you can imagine, like, that is like a, a, such a strategic hub for trade, coming, coming into, the, into the Mesopotamian area and then going up the rivers and, and all that kind of stuff. So Ur, it, it's, it's an incredibly rich uh, capital city of the Sumerian Empire. And it's dominated... By the worship of one particular god. It is known for the one god. The worship of the moon god. The moon god. Na-a-nan. Nope. N-A-A-N-N-A. -A -A. na a na At least in either Akkadian or Sumerian, the other name is Sin. S-I-N-S-E-N. All right? Sin. So I'll, maybe I'll go with that one. Na-a-na. na a na Nana, right? No, no, I just, uh, so, uh, or sin, right? Oh, oh, let me show you some pictures here of Ur. So they, they've been doing a lot of excavation work here uh, of, of the, of the they've started uncovering incredible palaces, pulling out some, finding some pretty significant treasures. Again, this was such a rich, rich city, uh, a very rich port city. You can just see some of the archaeology in the foreground of the city. Uh, in the background, you can see it's a ziggurat. It, it's, a, it's a worship place. It's a massive, massive thing that was restored kind of in Daniel's day, if you're just following the Bible story. A uh, better picture of the ziggurat up close. So the ziggurat, it, it's, it's a worship foundation place, and on top of it is going to be a shrine. And in this case, to Na'anan. Na-na-na-na-na-na-na. On top there, moon god, sin. Sin. A, a, a capital a word god. Now, you see how dominating this is over the, over the town, over the city. Not town, it was a city. Uh, dominant, this, this is a focal point for the city. Terah, Abraham's dad, probably worshipped many gods. But 
almost certainly, certainly, it would be in, hard to even imagine him not worshiping the moon god as well, because that is the god of his city, the god of his town. So you, Tara, coming here, the, the, this ziggurat, and, and being a part of, of worship here. Here's some, some pictures, some ancient pictures of what the moon, how the moon god is depicted in ancient art. So we've got ziggurat. Hello, ziggurat. Hello, pictures. So the, the symbol for the moon god is the crescent moon facing up, like a cup, like a bowl. You can see it in these different art, featuring the, the, the image of the icon of the, the moon god. We, we who follow Jesus, we have the cross symbolizing Jesus. This, the moon shaped like that, represents the, the demonic um, wo- moon god or deity sort of a thing in this place called sin which is helpful so we know that's not the right thing that's the symbol there again so abraham's story is starting right down from babel where he's born moon god worshiping family and other gods god called out to abraham and re- re- revealed himself to him now, let me read what it says in, in Genesis chapter 11. So this is the story right after Babel. It says, this is the account of Terah's family, Abraham's dad. Terah was the father of Abram, which is Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. Haran was the father of Lot. But Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans, the land of his birth, while his father Terah was still living. Meanwhile, Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. Milcah and her sister Ishka were daughters of Nahor's brother Haran. Uh, Yeah, I was going to ask, but I decided not to. But Sarai was unable to become pregnant and had no children. One day, Terah took his son Abram, his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife, and his grandson Lot, his son Haran's child, and moved away from Ur of the Chaldeans, he, went, he was headed f- for the land of Canaan. I mean, let me just read that because I kind of stumbled over that. He was headed for the land of Canaan, but they stopped at Haran and settled there. Terah lived for 205 years and died while still in Haran. Do you see the exact same words from the, the Babel story? By the way, Scotland Bible School starts this Tuesday. Tuesday night, you got 48 hours. I did buy a couple extra Bibles in case there's a last-minute sign-up or two sort of a thing. But during, in Scotland Bible School, we are going to be talking about Bible study methods. And one of the many skills is looking for repeated, repeated words, repeated words, repeated words, repeated phrases... And, and, and here we, we see the same thing. Anyways, so again, I'll see you Tuesday night. Sign up, run, don't walk. Anyways, uh, so it says here that Terah was headed for the land of Canaan. They did leave Ur. They did leave the, the city and, and their friends behind. They, they did take a risk moving uh, 641 miles as in a straight line, but over a, well over 1,000 via the roads and rivers. And they were on their way to Canaan, but they settled. They came to Haran, and they settled there. Same words, same chapter. Same words, same chapter. Why did they settle there? Well, let's look at the map again. So Haran is in the red circle at the top, number two up there, top of the map. And Canaan, where they're they're headed towards, is the third circle down on the bottom Left, the bottom left uh, of, of the map. Heron is vastly better than Canaan. Vastly better than Canaan. It is, especially if you got herds and sheep and all that kind of stuff, it is so much better 
It is, it is such an, an affluent place, especially for people like Abraham. It's not even close. It's on this river up there. There's no river down in Canaan. I mean, there's the, the Jordan River, but it's down in the Rift Valley. It's nearly worthless for the land. It's right on the river up there. It's so lush. It's, according to the, the earliest records, it, it also feels like Ur. It feels like home to them, right? And, and so it feels like home. Uh, apparently, Haran was founded as an outpost for Ur, like way upriver. And so it has the same culture, it, it has the same, same thing. Here's a picture of, of, of Haran. Now, I, I did resist um, showing pictures of Haran because there is nothing left from Abraham's day. So every, everything we see is it's just not how it was in Abraham's day. It was, it's been... It's been invaded and rebuilt and rebuilt over and over and over again throughout the centuries. So, uh, but, but it is this area. So Abraham comes to this area. His family comes to this area. But it's much more fertile than what you're seeing here. It was much more lush back, back then. Um, but, but Haran was just such a big deal. Uh, Abraham's family, when they moved here, they settled there. They lived in houses. Abraham continued to live in tents. But when you see Abraham's family coming looking for wives, you know, where, do, where do you look for a wife? Haran, right? So when they would go up there, they would be coming into houses. His family lived in houses up there. They settled. Uh, Kelly and I were talking this afternoon. He's like, well, what's the deal with Terah's son, one of his sons being named Haran, and then him dying, but then they come to a town named Haran? What's going on there? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know what's going on there. It's probably one of those things like kids like, or parents like to name their kids after places they like, like Sky or Isla or Orlando, you know, th things like that. Uh, maybe, maybe it's, it's, I don't know, I have no answer for, for Kelly there. But if you know what, the, how to answer Kelly's question, you, you, can, you can do it. So, so back to the map for a second. So again, Ur being founded, uh, or sorry, Heron being founded by Ur like so much long ago. It, it was dedicated, it became a, a, a second and then only worship center for the moon god. They dedicated Haran as, as a moon god place in the north. Again, Ur will fade over time in, in its importance. But Haran then becomes this, the center of worship for the moon god. And kings, uh, empire kings throughout the centuries would pilgrimage to Haran because it became the, the center of, of worship for the moon god. So you would have even kings and empire kings like named after the moon god or moon god connected to their names such as Sin, Sennacherib. Of Assyria, mentioned in the Bible. Sennacherib, like connected to the worship of moon god, which is right there from, from Haran. So you can imagine Terah and his family, they, they're moving along. They go up the, the river there, uh, and they, they come along, and they come to a place that feels like home. The, they were, they're worshiping Terah's god here, the, the moon god. It's lush. It's way better than the land that they were on their way to. And, and they, they look with their eyes and they, they, they just, and Tara's like, you know what, we're going to settle here. And with the eyes and human reasoning, it's a good idea. It's better. Easier prosperity. It's safer. You're going to hear Abraham's story. He's afraid at times for his life. You're going to look at pictures of where Abraham settles. Very deserty, most of it. This is so much better than where Abraham's going to go. And yet, it's not where God was calling them to go. It is so easy to want to settle and stop obeying God when, when, when we look with our eyes and we see a reality that looks better to us, easier to us, maybe more prosperous to us than the path that God's calling us to walk. It is so hard. To, to keep following God in those moments. Well, Terah, he just decides, he decides, you know, we followed God, we left Ur, but now we're going to settle here. And, and by settling, they stopped. And they stopped following God. Again, I just think one of the great warnings that comes out of following the flood story, the first, the first fail stories coming out of the flood, the start over moment on planet Earth, is people starting to follow God and then stopping, settling, settling. 
maybe because they're seduced by prosperity or ease or just not wanting to take and go any further following God anymore. I, I don't, do you ever feel the pressure to settle? Maybe you've, maybe you've made some changes in your life. And you've, you've worked really hard at making this character change or said no to this sin or, or this addiction or this vice or whatever. And, and then there's another one now in front of you. And you're like, oh, but I really like this sin. Oh, I know. You're being tempted by it, right? You're, I really like this. And I, I don't know if I want to, yeah. No, keep going. Don't settle here. Yes, you've made progress, but don't settle here. Keep going. Or you feel like God's, God's calling you to, to take a risk or to... To take a step that maybe doesn't seem easy. Don't settle where you're at. Like keep trusting Jesus. Keep going. Keep going. Don't stop. I never want to stop. Listen to what Hebrews 3 says. For if we are faithful to the end, Trusting God just as firmly as when we first believed, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. I'm human, I know. I know the allure. I know the allure to stop and settle and to be like, oh, I've done so much. Why do I need to take, need to take this next difficult step? But friends, set your life to never settle, to keep running. Trusting is trusting. Trusting keeps trusting. At the beginning, we looked at Hebrews chapter 11. And and actually, there's a lot more about Abraham in Hebrews chapter 11 than what we read at first. One of the sections in the Abraham bit in Hebrews chapter 11, it says this in, in verse 15. It says, if they had longed for the country they came from, Ur, which was a rich, rich, prosperous city, or Haran, which was vastly uh, easier to, to prosper and to be safe, if they had longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back. But they were looking for a better place. With their eyes? No, a heavenly place. A heavenly homeland. That's why God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he has prepared a city for them. Abraham could have quit. He could have gone back. He could have settled. He could have returned. But he didn't. And so, he's called God's friend. And so he is called the father of faith. For all who believe. Because he kept trusting. And he kept running after God. Friends, we worship the God who can be trusted. And the one who can be trusted with our past. But he can be trusted with with our future. We serve the God who can continue to be trusted all the days of our lives. Not just once, but but forever. One of my big fears, I don't want to settle. I don't want to settle. And I encourage you, make that your resolve with me. Never settle. Never settle. Keep trusting. Keep trusting. For the next few weeks, we're going to keep looking at Abraham, the one who keeps, go, uh, keeps going, the one who doesn't quit, the one who keeps trusting God, who refuses to settle. It's going to be great, but for now, i got a challenge for you. The challenge is simply this. Identify where you're feeling tempted to settle and not keep trusting Jesus. Push back by rededicating yourself to keep trusting Jesus with your specific situations. Close your eyes. Why don't you close your eyes for a second? And, and, and if you feel a pull to settle, maybe you feel like God's calling you to, to take a risk or take a step or whatever. I want you to just take that to Jesus right now and say, God, I choose again to trust you with this. And I'm not going to settle. I'm going to keep trusting you. Maybe you've once prayed the prayer, God, would you just tell me what you want me to do? Now I want you to pray the prayer, give me the courage to always do it. To never settle. Maybe during this time you even just dedicate your life. God, I believe in you. 
and I've committed my life to you, and I'm telling you, I am committed to never settling. Maybe you've never dedicated your life to Jesus, or you've been away for a while and you need to rededicate your life to Jesus. I suggest praying something like this, God, here I am. I start today. I start again today. And I dedicate my life to trusting you and to obeying you from here on. Whether things go good or whether things are challenging, I commit my life to following you. I commit my life to moving forward, to keeping trust in you and never settling. Father, fill us with courage and boldness and that passion to keep trusting you all the days of our life. You've proven and proven and proven you can be trusted, that you're safe to trust. Yeah, lead us forward in Jesus' name. Amen.